The following program is a specialty program. Unless otherwise identified, the participants on the program are not employees of Chorus Entertainment. Opinions expressed may not necessarily reflect the views and policies of Global News Radio 640 Toronto. Dr. Lou is well, and the long form podcast series continues the Lou Down. Where if you get your uh, favorite podcast, you can uh, get on board with that. But like I said, here and now, you have. Uh, some issues, uh, physical issues, uh, musculoskeletal or otherwise, just want some advice, uh, get pointed down the right road, call us. Live call in show, 416-870-6400. Dr. Lou, what's going on, pal? How are you? John, good morning. I'm well. How are you? Ready to roll. Ready to roll. What are we talking as, about? As always. As yeah, you. Um, one thing that uh, we've, we've been speaking about for a few months now, and it's really getting exciting for me because... Um, I finally have been able to do the follow-up. So it, I'm talking about the genomic testing. So yeah. um, back around November, we started talking about this. There were an influx of people that got, started getting tested. Um, it takes some time to get the results, and the results are, have started to pour in over the month of January and, and early February. And I've had the opportunity in my clinical practice to now give these results to people, go through them, see the impact it has on them. And in, in all honesty, it's actually been phenomenal. It's been a great experience. It's one of those things that is really good for your overall wellness. I've said multiple times on the show, this is not diagnostic. This is not trying to you know, cure anything or figure anything out, but it gives you a picture of who you are genetically and in four big categories. And within those categories, it can help you to make what I'm really recommending to people is the lifestyle changes that they can make, the things that they can do day to day. So here's a perfect example, and I, and I want to sort of, and I'm happy, again, as you've said, John, this is a live show, so if people have questions about this, call in now, ask uh, questions. If you've heard me talk about it over the last few months or curious, you can always call after the show at one eight five 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 doctor Lou or send an email to info at pinpointhealth.ca. But just going through some of this stuff, so this report is broken down into four main sections, the first section being mood and behavior, okay? And... Some of the first things that we look at in uh, when if, if you get this report done, the way you'll get it is it'll say what the gene is, then it will give you what your genotype is. There's usually three to five options of the type of gene that you the specific variation of that gene that you may have. And then it helps to give a little bit of a description on what that gene may mean. So when we look at some of the, and I won't go through specific genes here, but just very high level, when we start in mood and behavior, one of the things that it looks at, the first couple, um, look, look at dopamine um, and the ability for it to be bound to other things and how long it takes to get cleared out. And it's overly scientific stuff. But what people need to understand about that is dopamine is a feel-good hormone. It's the thing that gets released when we're happy, when we're excited. And this may very well give people an indication as to where there's a genotype. So as an example, this and this is great, right? So you know, one of the big things that's happened in the last few years is cannabis use, as an example. Mm -hmm. yep. So one of the very first genes that we look at is called COMT, and you can have variations in this gene. As an example, I have, and I'm going to use my specific case, um, as I've done previously, I have what's called the GG genotype. So you can either have an AA genotype, you can have an AG genotype, or a GG genotype. Okay. One of the things that's really interesting with the GG genotype is that there, and, and, and the, there's a lot of, re, there's research behind this. Some studies have suggested that that GG genotype tends to be more prone to schizophrenic behavior if there's cannabis use in early life. Now, Someone may think, well, why does that matter? It matters a lot. There's a whole division at McMaster University related to looking at the effects of, you know, anything in moderation is good, but anything in excess is bad, and that includes cannabis. And there is a subgroup of people that develop schizophrenic behaviors as a result of cannabis use. Now, I'm no longer young, as an example, right? This is talking about early life in your teens. But I know that my genotype is GG. I have young children that are going to grow up to be teenagers, okay? I think it's going to be important for me to find out where they sit on that spectrum of their genotype. Not that I don't want them to use cannabis one day or do any of those things, but at least to understand the moderation and the risks that it may pose to them, right? If they have the same genotype as me, right. GG, 
you know, we know what could happen. And, you know, I know even with myself, I've used cannabis before in my life. I haven't used it excessively or anything. But I know that there's been some times where it's created more anxiety in me and more worrisome. And I could see why my genetics are, you know, you, you meet people that can use it and it's no problem. And then you meet other people that, you know, can get the anxiety and all the way to the schizophrenic behaviors. Well, it's no surprise that, you know, I felt the way I did because of this genotype so this for me gives me something that for my kids i want to know that i want to know that the reality is cannabis use is prevalent it's always been prevalent it's more prevalent now because it's legal and because of that i want to make sure that whatever my kids are doing doesn't predispose them to something like schizophrenia or schizophrenic behaviors so i thought that was a really really interesting thing the next gene um, that looks and and even in that right like let's say I had the AA genotype I said that I had the GG well the AA genotype is interesting so actually let's go back the GG which I have is overall known as the warrior strategy so this is sort of like in in stress I can take it head on like I'm good at you know facing it you you take on <clears throat> excuse me that warrior mentality. Whereas the A genotype or the AA genotype, what you end up finding is that is more of a worrier personality. These are people with stress, they retreat, they're unable to perform and all of these things. And again, this might be very important for you to know because what it may do is it may allow you, like once you know that about yourself, you, let's say you find out you're an AA genotype and you're a worrier. That doesn't mean you're doomed. It means now behavioral therapy psychological behavioral therapy may actually be of benefit to you it may actually help you to get over this because you can you can change the environmental expression of the things you do and you can help control those things so i think that's a pretty powerful thing when we move on to the the next gene uh that also looks at dopamine again this is you can have the aa or the ag or the gg and as an example, I have the GG genotype again. Um, and so this is, again, this is, this is interesting. So some of this um, with, the, with the GG genotype, um, what we see is that there's um, increased caloric intake. So these are people that like when stress comes, your body actually uses more energy. You know, when we've talked about, you know, you've probably heard people, John, say that when they're stressed, they either gain weight or they tend to lose weight. Right. Um, a lot of that probably has to do with your cal caloric consumption as it relates to what your brain does when, when you're under levels of stress. And so this can help identify some of those things. And if I'm rambling too much, John, because, you know, I, for me, this stuff has become almost like second nature. But if you think I'm getting too deep here, stop me and, I, and I'll try to clarify for the listener too what we're talking about, um, because I think it's important. But I think these things are really, really powerful things. Um, uh, to know, to understand, one of the other genes um, is what's called ADRA to be their, you know, long names. In this one, you can have an II genotype, you can have an ID genotype, or you can have a DD genotype. Okay. Um, and this one's really interesting because in the DD genotype, okay, this one is there's some evidence that suggests that people with the DD genotype don't respond so well to SSRIs, which are a class of medication often used as antidepressants. Um, and that's, again, a powerful thing to understand about yourself, right? I specifically am an II genotype, so there's no association there. So if, if ever I needed to take an antidepressant, it probably would mesh well with my genetics in terms of wow. what it's trying to do. Whereas someone who has the DD, there's potentially poor response to that. And it's funny, I've talked to some people now that have had the DD genotype, and I've said, oh, you, you might be a poor responder to SSRIs, which are a class of antidepressants. And they've turned around to me and said, yeah, I, you know, I was put on that once upon a time, and I stopped it immediately. I just found that it was making me feel really, really horrible. I was feeling oh. worse. That is powerful information totally. to know about your genetics, to understand the way things can react. And, and this is what I'm talking about. This is the next level of, of healthcare because I'm not saying antidepressants are bad, right? I've never said that, and I'm not saying it now. I'm saying that we should understand which people it might be worse for and which people it's, it might be more beneficial. And for me, it seems that if I had to take an antidepressant, which I'm, you know, I, I hope that I never have to, but if I did, I wouldn't have necessarily a poor response to it. And 
John, let me preface one thing. I know we're getting close to the break, and I know people are hearing these things. None of these things are absolute. These are things based on studies, and these are what the studies are showing. It doesn't mean it's necessarily an absolute law. It's just the evidence that we have thus far is suggesting these things. And I think, you know, as, a, as an evidence-based practitioner, we've got to stick with where the evidence points us. Let's take a short break. You have questions about this entire topic. Uh, bring them on or anything uh, else having to do with your own personal health care. That's why the show is here. We answer all questions. So don't, uh, don't, bash, don't be bashful. Don't hesitate. 416-870-6400. It's Pinpoint Health Show, and this is Global News Radio. 1120, back to the Pinpoint Health Show. Yeah, the phone line's open here live now, 416 870 6,400, you have pain or health concerns, bring it on. That's uh, the, the phone call is always invited over the course of this hour during the Pinpoint Health Show. Info at pinpointhealth.ca and pinpointhealth.ca, the website to reach out to a clinic that is open and operational uh, near you. And for more information, of course, uh, anytime. Talking about the genomic testing uh, this hour, Dr. Lou, you know, you said something off the top about you know the risk of cannabis and schizophrenia, and, you know, this is early on. Um, with younger people. And that was, that was kind of my first question when you wanted to talk about the genomic testing. How young can someone be to have the, I know it's a very simple test. It's a saliva test and it gets sent away and it's, you know, it's very, it's not, not invasive at all, but how young yeah. can someone be to have this, uh, this testing done? I, I, you know, I would say anybody that for sure is in their teens. I mean, your mm-hmm. genes don't, don't change. Right. So um, right. I would think at that age, yeah, you could, you could definitely um, have it done. And just to get a look at, at some of these things, um, so moving forward from that, that was sort of some of the stuff on the mood and behavior, which I think there is powerful. There's there's other stuff in the mood and behavior, but I want to try to get through um, all of the sections. The next one, which has been very interesting for a lot of people, and one of the main reasons is the cardiovascular um, report, which which is important. And you know, the first three uh, genes essentially that are tested in this, more than anything, are looking at the risk of coronary artery disease and stroke and the way cholesterol is built up and, you know, whether it leads to, to those types of things. And, um, you know, a lot of people have an increased risk of this type of stuff. And as an example, where this can be a powerful tool, because I think that is the most important thing. Like, where is the applicability of this testing? Because it's one thing to find out, okay, I'm at high risk of coronary artery disease and stroke. But then the next thing is, well, what can you do? As an example, I was talking to a patient yesterday going through their results with them. And in these three categories, they were at a high risk of coronary artery disease and and stroke. It was not news to them because there was a family history of these things. Where it was important was once I started getting into, okay, are you physically active? And the answer was yes. And then the next question was like, well, what are you doing to be physically active? And what they were doing was the high intensity training, high intensity interval training, hit training. Yeah. And this is important because so this person was 60 years old, okay? Maximum heart rate is is based on an equation of 220 minus your age. So if you're 60 years old, your maximum heart rate is about 160, okay? okay. If you've got a maximum heart rate of 160, we know based on research for cardiovascular health that the ideal way to achieve the most preventative um effects from 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 exercise is to stay at about 60 percent of your maximum heart rate for about 30 to 40 minutes three to four times a week okay so we know at 160 60 percent of that is roughly about 100 110 well guess what high intensity training is probably going to take you to closer to 80 85 percent of your maximum heart rate once you're putting in that kind of pressure through your your cardiovascular system you may be predisposing yourself further. And this is, again, mean. I am not saying that high-intensity training is bad. What I'm saying is when I ask this person, why are you doing the high-intensity interval training, the question was for heart health because that's what they thought. And I said, well, I think there's better things that you could be doing that don't take you there, right? And you're also 60, so you've got to worry about, you know, if you're on a treadmill going to those maximum things, that's a pretty good run and all those things. So I basically suggested to convert to a program that was focused more on 30 to 35 minutes, three times a week, 
of, uh, of something that would take her to about 100, 110, maybe 120 heart, uh, beats per minute in her heart rate. And that is what the research shows is going to be beneficial for decreasing the likelihood of cardiovascular types of events. And so that was a powerful thing to know that we were able to change the exercise plan that they're on in order to actually fit their genetics. So this is the beauty about this. This isn't nothing that I've said so far is like, oh, and then you have to buy this $15,000 machine, right? Or, <laughs> or this, you know, massively expensive tool. This just gives you something to hang your hat on so that when you're trying to do the right things in life, which is why this is very much something that I'm recommending for wellness, people who are genuinely interested in how can you be well, this is something good because you can really define how being well is specific to your genetics, okay? So again, to me, that, that was an incredibly important thing. Here's another thing. One of the genes in this cardiovascular report call, called SLC01B1, very complicated names, um, has three variations of a genotype, okay? You can have a CC, you can have a TC, or a TT. What this is looking at is actually your ability to metabolize or break down statins. Now, people have probably heard of statins like statin drugs. These are the class of yes. medications given for cholesterol, right? Lipitor, Crestor, these types of things. We also have statins naturally in our body that do this. But why this is important is depending on your genotype, stat, when, when in that process, one of the things that can happen, sometimes you may have heard people say and and doctors have asked people, like when they're put on these types of medications, are you getting muscle pain, right? Yeah. And one of the things is if you're not a normal statin metabolizer, you might be at an increased risk of myopathy, which means mu muscle and tissue pain. So as an example, the CC genotype, okay, is at an increased risk, a significantly increased risk based on the research of myopathy, right? So that's important for you to know not just if you're on that medication, but also, you know, statins break down cholesterol. So if you're on a high fat diet and you have to have more of your natural statins doing that work, it, there might be a reason if you're feeling pain, a lot of muscle ache and pain, it might actually be related to the fact that you don't metabolize those statins well. Okay. As hmm. whereas I am a TT, which is a normal statin metabolizer. So, and that will, will come into play later because my genetics also show that fat consumption is actually not harmful for me. So it makes sense why I would line up with those two things. But this again would be a powerful thing for someone to know, even if, for example, they have high cholesterol, they're already on uh, medication, it might be beneficial to know, do you metabolize your statin well? And if not, and if these people more so have some type of muscle ache or they've been getting weird aches and pains that they can't describe, it may very well be related to the metabolization of the statin. Now, what does that mean? That means then you can go to your doctor, whoever's prescribed you that medication, and have a conversation, see if there's alternatives, if there's other things. But the whole thing here, again, is wellness. That's why this is so incredibly important. The next section of the cardiovascular report looks at um, B12 levels, okay, and also folate levels, so the B vitamins, which this is really, this is really, really interesting for me when it comes to the world that I live in, in terms of my scope of practice and the things that I actually assess, which is mainly musculoskeletal issues. So many people have numbness, tingling, weird sensations, all this yep. stuff. And a lot of the B vitamins, you know, uh, cobalamin, B12, folate, all of these things are so incredibly important towards nerve function. So a lot of people out there may have, and I've used myself as an example, these weird numbness, tingling types of sensations that happen here or there. And, you know, the most important thing is to get the more serious causes of that ruled out. But then you sit at a level where you're like, okay, I, they've been able to find nothing, and yet I'm still getting these things. Like, what is it? Well, I was able to find out as an example with my own case where I was deficient or my ability to my enzyme function for that was low. And so I've just been supplementing with more B complexes and it's helped tremendously. I've, I've been able to eliminate the numbness and tingling and if, if not 100 percent, at least 99 percent, um, which has been important. And, and it might just simply be related to B complexes. Um, now, you could also try and just sup you don't need to necessarily have a test to do that. You could, if you've got that type of stuff and you want to try B complexes, you could, but 
you know, the thing that I really like about this is you're not shooting in the dark. You're, you're actually aiming at something. You're, you, you know something about yourself. Um, and again, to me, that's a, a very, very powerful uh, tool. Um, moving on here, this, this, this is interesting. So one of the things that you can actually find in, in a gene MC4R um, is has to do with dysregulation of hunger cues. So hunger cues are, you know, when when you're hungry, your body sends a message to your brain saying, "Hey, I'm hungry." Um, you can actually look at the genotypes to see how do you have normal hunger cues? Are they a little dysfunctional? Or are they very dysfunctional? And you know that can give you. So as an example, I have what's called the TC genotype. Once you have the C genotype that actually creates a dysregulation of hunger cues and an increased um, snacking behavior. So these are people like me who, you know, all of a sudden your body's sending you a message saying you're hungry, but you're not really hungry. It's dysregulated for whatever reason, and you're snacking. Now, again, what can you do to change this? This becomes very much, hey, those are my genetics. Now it becomes a behavioral approach. Now I have to control myself. These may be people, like for me, my solution to it is just don't put that stuff in the house. If I don't have it in the house, even though I have those cues, I can't go and get anything. So I just sort of suck it up, right? Whereas, you know, if you've got normal hunger cues and you're on a diet, you may not necessarily have to eliminate everything out of your house. You can maybe keep it there because you have a good ability to control yourself and do those things. And so, again, that's an important thing. When you know that about yourself, for me, it just means, hey, I can't have it in the house. I can't have it around me because I know there's a dysregulation with my hunger cues. And, again, a powerful, powerful tool. Um, yeah, it's amazing all these all these things so far. I mean, other than the test itself, which I'm sure you'll you'll talk about how do we how to get it, what it costs. All these things are just information, and there has not been uh, mentioned of a machine or a you know a, a tub of something you have to mix with water and it's going to cost you a fortune. It's it's phenomenal. It's just knowledge. Knowledge is there, right? It's not. It's knowledge about who you are genetically and how this can build a picture. Um, the next thing where we get into sort of, um, you know, and, and you, you, you and I have spoken about this, John, and it's really interesting, is once you get into, so one of the genes, APOA2, actually looks at what happens when you eat fat. Does it lead to weight gain or does it not? And this is really powerful. That Later on, there's also going to be another one that looks at, well, what about starches? If you eat starches, does that lead to weight gain or not? These two things are really powerful, again, because what you can do is determine the ideal diet for you. And you don't have to take this into isolation because then you could take it into consideration with everything else, your risk of cardiovascular health and all of those things. But as an example, I have the AA genotype in that specific gene, which has no association of weight gain in response to fat consumption. I also, nice. in my genetic profile earlier on, have good lipid metabolism and low likelihood of cholesterol. So for me, a high fat diet is actually ideal, like a keto type of diet. Now, you know, obviously when I say high fat, that doesn't mean like, you know, French fries and really, and yeah, you know, ice fat. cream every night. It means good <laughs> fats, good fats being things like avocados, nuts, um, olives, uh, different healthy oils, and these types of things, eggs, so that type of stuff is not something that I necessarily have to stay away from. And this is really important when someone's trying to build a diet plan specific to themselves because they often sit there wondering, well, what can I eat and what can't I eat, right? Like, yeah. And you don't necessarily need to be fully one way or fully the other way, but you can sit there and in my genetic profile, I know that I'm good with fat consumption and I'm moderate with starch consumption. So what does that mean for me? I do focus more on the those healthy fats but I do include simpler carbohydrates, fruits, vegetables, and that type of stuff. And I just really try to limit as much as possible the heavy starches like the pastas, the breads, and that type of stuff. And that helps me to stick with a plan that is actually working for me. And again, I'm not guessing, and I'm giving it a fair shot. I'm not stopping after four weeks because I haven't seen results. I'm sticking with it, and I'm stuck with it, and it's working. Take a short break. We'll tell you how to, uh, to get a hold of this in just a bit as we go through more of this uh, genomic testing. It's fantastic stuff, and it's, uh, it really is groundbreaking in the next level for sure as far as healthcare is concerned. You want to call in and ask a question about that or anything else, do so. Got lots of time. Phones are quiet, but the lines are open. 416-870-6400. It's 1134, so you still got uh, plenty of time. Pinpoint Health Show, Global News Radio. And welcome back, Pinpoint Health Show. It is uh, 11.36 here. Dr. Lou answering all your questions, talking about the genomic testing. 
uh, phone calls, uh, 416-870-6400. Let's get to a, a quick one here. Miriam, thanks for standing by. Uh, good morning. How are you? Good morning. You have a question? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. First of all, great show. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I want to ask you, I have in my family and myself, um, I have two kids um, with signs of depression. Uh, they're taking um, fluoxetine. In, um, they also have another uh, stomach issues like IBS, colitis. I have my husband and myself with fibromyalgia. Then I find your show and then everything you see and say very interesting. Um, I just want to know how to get in touch, how to get the testing done. Mm. Um, yeah, sure. So you can always call me at one eight five 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 Doctor Lou D R L O U. The the one thing that I will say here is I am not a mental health professional. So in terms of the depression stuff and all that, that is something that I really think you have to see the right professionals. I can help get you in touch with those right professionals for sure. But even with this testing, this testing is not going to tell you anything about in terms of whether depression is something that is diagnosed clinically. It's not diagnosed on a test, right? In terms of the fibromyalgia stuff, that definitely is more in the realm of what I deal with and, and something that I can probably help with. But I want to be clear, this this report, this, this genomics testing is very much a wellness type of report that looks more at your overall genetic profile and it is not necessarily going to be diagnostic for anything or necessarily provide any treatment intervention specifically for something like depression. I know, but my kids are taking medication and they don't react properly. And the way you explain it is maybe because their genes not... Um no yeah, potentially there's the yeah potentially there's that one that one gene that I said which might be a poor responder to the SSRI. Even in that case, the one thing that again I want to preface is even if you found that out, I would not recommend anybody to discontinue their medication unless you speak with the treating professional who's put them on that medication. This is it's like any test, right? Even what I do when I you know see an X-ray or whatever, you never take anything in isolation. You have to take the image, the test in conjunction with the actual clinical picture, and that's the way decisions need to be made. No, no, of course. But what I'm saying is, what what you uh, talking about today about the show is very important because it does help. It does give you um, information about your body, your your genetics. That they are important. Right. Doctors, doctors go directly, oh, you feel depressed, take this. It, it's just a prescription. They don't go more deep in what is the cause right. of what's going. The roots, not just put a band yeah. on it and that's it. Then, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a generalized comment. That's not true of everybody. I know a lot of people, uh, a lot of doctors who do, who do the right thing. That may very well uh, be your experience, and, and I can appreciate that. But again, it's more complicated than that too, right? A lot of this is, is behavioral. There's other things outside of just genetics. Remember, what, who we are as of people is a mixture of our biology, our genetics, and also environment, the things that influence potentially our genetics. So, But give me a call, and I'm happy to discuss this uh, further with you. Miriam, that is a one eight five five. Pardon me, a one eight five 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 five. Doctor Lou D R L O U. That is the way to uh, go forward with that. Wayne, thanks for standing by. Good morning. That influence potentially our genetics. So, hey, Wayne. Colin, I'm happy to discuss this uh, further with you. Wayne. Miriam, that is a one eight five five. Yeah. Hi, Wayne. <laughs> okay, we'll put Wayne on hold until uh, the call screener can figure him out. Uh, back to it. Yeah, the gen- uh, genomic testing. Like you said, it's not a, it's not an absolute, but it is. It's a piece of the puzzle. It's another. Uh, Arrow in your quiver of, of healthcare, right? I mean, really, that's the way to look at it, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and this is, it's again, really, really important to understand that this is, you know, and a lot of people will call and they want to get a little bit more clarity. It's really more information, general information, like a wellness type of report than it is diagnostic, okay? Uh, here's another one that I think is a good, good thing for that a lot of people probably want to know, the gene UCP1. This looks at thermal regulation and uh, resting metabolic rate. So your thermal regulation and resting metabolic rate is essentially, if you laid in bed all day, John, how many calories would you burn based on your size and the way your body works? You and I, John, both know people that can eat 
anything they want, do very little exercise, and they never gain a pound. And yeah, like this them. is important. <laughs> yeah, we don't like them exactly. Yeah, we don't like them very much. But this is important because depending on your thermal regulation, as an example, I have the AA genotype, which gives me suboptimal thermal regulatory control and resting metabolic rate, which means that if I don't exercise, I'm more likely to gain weight, right? And this, mm. this can help determine how much exercise should you be doing, right? Like if I was a complete GG genotype, which is even worse than the AG, I should probably be doing even more than I'm doing now in order to achieve weight gain and weight control. So this is important, right? It helps also to de define the frequency and duration of the things you're doing. And, and again, a very, very powerful tool. Um, the next one I've talked about before, you can look at uh, insulin response and whether you have optimal insulin response or suboptimal insulin response and what that does to your risk of type 2 diabetes. As an example, I have the GG genotype, which gives me optimal insulin response and at a reduced risk of type 2 diabetes, very, very important here. Reduced risk means that I still need to do the right things. Diabetes is very much a lifestyle disease. If all you do is eat starchy carbs, even though you have that, you're going to develop diabetes. What you need to do is just be moderate and in control about those things, and that's really important. The next one is looking at starch metabolism, which I've tied in with the fat consumption. Yeah. Um, and again, this knowing that those two things is really important. The next one looks at uh, persistence to lactose. Uh, and this can give you an indication to as uh, how much dairy maybe you should or should not consume. Again, these things help you to build a diet plan. I think a lot of times people are very confused where whenever they're trying something new, it's like, I don't know what to eat. Well, instead of trying to follow like a pure keto diet or a pure vegetarian diet or whatever it may be, you can understand your genetic profile and say, okay, well, you know, as an example, based on my genetics, I know that I should be more on the healthy fats. I'm okay to have simpler types of carbs like the vegetables and the fruits. And in terms of dairy, I can have a moderate amount. I shouldn't overdo it, though. There's a perfect diet for me based on my genetic profile. That gives me a ton of options in terms of Thank what you. I can eat. Right. And, and it's really, really important for someone to know that because it also helps people once you have more variety and you can plan it out that way, it gives you more variety and it gives you more likelihood to stick with what you're doing. I think one of the things that often makes people fail is when it's too restrictive. And if you're just following any one of these things to, to a T, it may be too restrictive for what you're looking for in your life. Um, and, and that's that again, I keep saying it, a powerful tool. Uh, the next step looks at vi uh, levels of vitamin C and, and activation of vitamin D. And again, this can help you build a picture of, you know, should you be supplementing with these things, yes or no, uh, and what that might mean to overall things. Like as an example, with vitamin D, vitamin D is also important in bone health and osteoporosis. So if you're someone that ha is very poor in vitamin D, this may also predispose you later on in life and you can understand these things and then you know you might say to me well what do you do outside of just supplementing well we know bone health increases bone density increases with resistance training so you know you can start to incorporate some of that resistance training and help get your bone mineral density up and and help to prevent these types of issues that may be inherent in your genomics down the line um again really really powerful stuff i think john to understand these types of things you bet. We'll take uh, one final break here, see if we get Wayne on the line. And uh, if not, you got time to call through as well. Still got a few minutes to go. 416-870-6400. Info at pinpointhealth.ca to reach out through email as well. And we'll continue, continue on here with the Pinpoint House Show on Global News Radio. Welcome back, Pinpoint Health Show. Got about uh, eight minutes left here in the show, so you want to slide in a call. Now would be the time to do it. Have we got Wayne figured out? Hey, Wayne. Hi, how are you? I uh, have a real quick question. I'm a sure. terrible salt user, user, so about five years I switched to no salt and salt-free. Is that good to you, for you, than uh, regular salt? So, so what do you mean by regular salt? Like you're using no salt whatsoever? No. Or the, or the product no salt. Is that the it's way you use product, it? Oh, I see. No salt yeah. and salt-free. Right. Um, in all honesty, I'm not even familiar with the product, no, or no salt or salt-free. Um, in terms of salt in general, I mean, 
again, everything comes down to sort of your personal health. Like, you know, if someone's got high blood pressure that's uncontrolled, then yeah, definitely diminishing um, that is important. Now, salts also imp provide important functions in the body. So th some, some level of salt is probably um, important. But again, I think that in terms of whether it's hard for me to say some, whether something is good or bad if I don't understand someone's full uh, clinical picture. And, and, I, and I don't know what to say for you in that sense. It, it may very well be the right choice for you. It may, it may not. I'm not sure. What was your, I guess, original reason for eliminating salt? Oh yeah, we, he dropped him. We dropped him, or he could, he got dropped anyway. I, I assume, I don't know. I guess maybe he was told. That you got to assume either he thinks on his own, or maybe he's told that to cut back in the salt. I mean, and like you've always said, you know, everything in moderation is okay. It's just when you go to extremes with anything, whether it's salt or sugar yeah. or fat or anything else, it's it's not good for you, right? So, I no, mean, it's not good. Sure. And again, understanding your specific. Um, health is really important. Again, in the example of someone who's got very high uncontrolled blood pressure, even with medication, then yeah, you'd want to do everything possible to to decrease that blood pressure. And salt is one of those things. So you you would try to to eliminate it as much as possible. There are other people as a counterexample who actually naturally will have very low blood pressures and often need more salt. They actually crave it. My wife is an example of that. Uh, her blood pressure is quite low, and so her body naturally is looking for that more often because it's, mm. it, it wants to keep that blood pressure um, higher. So it, it's it's interesting the way uh, these things work. Get to uh, to Patty. Hey, Patty, thanks for standing by. Good morning. How are you? Good morning, fellas. Hope you're having a good day. Yeah, you too. What's uh, what's Thank up? You. So my question is this. I'm, I'm 38 years old, and, and the idea of getting one of these tests done to sort of give me a picture of what I have to look forward to is, is quite intriguing. However, I've heard some rumors uh, that once you receive the results for this, that insurance companies can have the ability to access that and then can use that information of knowing that you may or may not be predisposed to something to be adjusting uh, policies or have an effect on how they insure you. Is that accurate, first of all? And if so, how do they get, get access to this, and, and what can I do as as someone who's looking to learn more about my genetic makeup, but not to get uh, hosed by an insurance company. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I'm going to sort of answer it, but at the same time, not answer it. Cause I, you know, my, I'm not an insurance broker or whatever. So my, that's not my world. My world is simply looking at things from a, a clinical value for a patient. Um, you know, I've heard the same things. My understanding with the company that we use is this is all completely secure. Uh, there's no way for anyone to get a hold of it. Now, here's the reality about insurance anyways. So, you know, because I've, you know, I've had life insurance before. When you, any test you get done, right? Like, like you can get something done and it can be as simple as like, have you ever had low back pain? And then, you know, I remember when I was applying for disability insurance because I'm self-employed. Um, and I was young and you have to sort of, they ask you, what, what is your full history? Like, what have you ever gone to the doctor for? And one of the things that I often had a lot of was upper back problems. So when I got my disability insurance, it included everything and excluded me for thoracic spine problems. So the reality is, you know, could insurance companies at some point request this stuff? Uh, yeah, they can, they can almost request, I guess, anything because that's, their job but from what i've heard in terms of this specific stuff i don't think so but i also don't know for sure um i can look into that um and ask a few people that i know that are in the insurance industry to find out more uh but you know it's it's a good it's a good question for sure it's a good it's a thing of concern but that's the reality about going to the doctor for anything right like the minute you go to the doctor for anything you, you're you're essentially opening yourself up to an insurance taking taking note of that Fair enough. All right. All right. Thanks, okay. Patty. Appreciate uh, appreciate the call. I, I just think you know it's it's an interesting question, but I th me personally, the the benefit of this testing far outweighs the uh, you know insurance implications that might not even come to fruition at that point. It might not. It might be a non-issue, like you said, especially if it's secure. But God, the information that this thing gives that far outweighs it for me. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And and like I said, there insurance companies are like I remember you know when I had to get life insurance. You know, one of the, they they ask for your height and weight, right? And depending on where you sit on a BMI scale, which is, you know, John, you know this very well. Like, you can have someone who is incredibly healthy, has a lot of muscle mass, but when you just take height relative to weight, it's gonna, you know, maybe put them in an obese category. But meanwhile, they're like, you know, 
yeah. look like a bodybuilder. Yeah. And, 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 and so, you know, they use that as a, as a disadvantage, you know? So, um, you know, that, that's the reality. I don't know. It's a good question. It's a, it's actually probably something that will, will be a question that will come up more. So I will get more educated on it and try to, um, provide a more clear answer on that. Yeah. Well, you got a, a couple minutes to go here, uh, literally. So, uh, how do you want to wrap this up? I guess, tell people how they can get a hold of this and how it goes. Yeah. Forward, the, right? Yeah, so the, it's the same way you can get a hold of me anyways for anything uh, else that you're wondering about. You would just simply call one eight five 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 doctor lou D-R-L-O-U. Um, you'll likely have to leave a, a message, and I will actually personally call you back. We'll discuss it. I want to make sure what you like I, I try to have the same spiel that I'm having on this radio show with everybody. Like, this is not diagnostic. This is not therapeutic per se this is really to look at an overall wellness picture for you and and if we come up if if you and i come up together to say yeah i think this might be a good idea then i will make the requisition it's a saliva based test that gets mailed to you 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 follow the instructions to get a saliva sample you mail it back out the report is created by the lab and it's emailed to you and then you typically people want to book following that with me and we just go through it it's, it's actually quite a simple process so email call um the test is not covered by ohip there is a fee for it it's a the the lab charges 550 dollars um but again you know like i i know it's not a small sum of money uh per se but you know it, it, it's these things often cost money when they're when they're new and and sure. cutting edge essentially and that is it for the day. Again, to reach out, one eight five 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 doctor Lou D R L O U info at pinpointhealth.ca and pinpointhealth.ca to get you pointed in the right direction to uh, contact Dr. Lou and a member of his amazing team at one of the clinics that are open and functioning, by the way. So take advantage of that. And we'll catch you next weekend right here, Pinpoint Health Show, Global News Radio. The preceding program is a specialty program. Unless otherwise identified, the participants on the program are not employees of Chorus Entertainment. Opinions expressed may not necessarily reflect the views and policies of Global News Radio 640 Toronto.